Hello, I'm Graciela Gelmini, and I will be your instructor for uh, this class, which will uh, be devoted to the theory of a special relativity formulated by Albert Einstein in 1905. This is a theory that deals with um, observers moving at constant velocity. These are inertial observers, as they are for classical mechanics. So let us start our class with uh, a question. The question is the following. Are you at rest? Are you at rest? Well, this doesn't have a, an answer because it's an incomplete question. Um, uh, because uh, it begs the clarification with respect to what? So are you at rest with respect to me? Yes. Uh, you are sitting there. I'm standing here. Are you at rest with respect to the sun, for example? No, you are not at rest, and I'm not at rest either. And we are at relative rest because we are moving at the same velocity. And this is the concept of rest. Rest is relative. Two bodies are at rest uh, when they are moving at the same velocity with respect to anything else. Uh, so let us consider the motion, for example, of a train. This is my rendition of a train and Bob sitting on the train. So the train is moving at a speed of 60 miles per hour with respect to the train tracks. But assume that there is a car and an is moving in the same direction at 30 miles per hour. Right? So the velocity of bomb with respect <coughs> to an is how much? like this. This would be 
necessarily moving at all. This would be moving much as the same as it was moving before. And this at the back, okay, since you are coming apart, uh, and it's moving in one direction, but the weight is coming apart from us, this is coming apart faster. Yes? Are you with me? Yes. Okay. People in 1800s thought that the same thing should happen with light. <coughs> and the nature of light is all of great importance for what we are going to say. So people knew early on, and you will see later on why, that light was a wave. And this is because um, when two waves uh, superpose, they form particular patterns, they are called interference patterns, and light does that as uh, two waves of water do, one wave do. So people knew that light was a wave. So the natural question is, if I have waves in water, you require water to have waves. In order to have waves, to have a disturbance, you have to have a medium in which the wave propagates, the wave is formed. So what is the medium that is waving in light? Well, people didn't know it, but they said, well, there must be a medium, and they call it ether. In particular, they call it um, luminiferous ether, which means carrying light. So in the same way, uh, waves in water require water, waves in the ether require the ether. And people know, people knew a lot about ether. They knew uh, so much, there were many papers written about it. <coughs> For example, let me show you one. This is a um, paper published in the Transactions of the Cambridge Philosophical Society. This is the same publication in which Newton, Isaac Newton, published, right? And this is from uh, 1839. And here you have the title. The title was On the Nature, etc., etc., of the Luminiferous Ether. Many papers about the properties. Since you see all the stars, the light coming from very far away, you know, it couldn't move, it couldn't be dragged, it couldn't be, you know, it couldn't. Many things, many properties of the Luminiferous What people didn't know is how we were moving with respect to the Luminiferous ether, or what was the rest frame of ether. <coughs> and um, so the rest frame of ether, so we were uh, not certainly, the earth was not certainly not moving with respect to the ether, because it could be dragged, you know, around, we should be moving to the thing to the ether. There was something else that people took as a very good indication that there was an ether. It was this. This is uh, a not very good photo of James Clerk Maxwell, Scottish physicist, who in 1965 came up with the equations of electromagnetism. This equation describes all electric and magnetic phenomena, and in particular, they describe light. Light is a disturbance of the medium that carries electric and magnetic uh, signals. And uh, there was only one value of the speed of light in those equations. This is what we call C, it's pretty fast, 300,000 kilometers. Since there was only one value, people said, ah, that's clear, right? So these equations are valid only if we are at rest with respect to the ether. Only an observer, like in the case of the pond, an observer that is at rest with respect to the pond would see these waves moving with 
velocity and the direction. In the same way, an observer that is at rest with respect to the ether would see the velocity of light being the same in every direction. Clear, right? Well, but that would imply something very profound because then I can uh, define uh, the ether at rest as absolute rest. That is a way of distinguishing a particular absolute rest. And everything that is moving with respect to the ether would be in absolute motion. So there was a way of distinguishing absolute rest and absolute motion. Not with respect to Earth. Remember that in the Aristotelian view, Earth was at rest in the universe and everything else was moving. So Earth is not at rest, but there was another way of defining the rest frame. Some people object that this that, you know, this cannot. In any case, there was a way of measuring if that was true. Because Earth is moving. Earth is moving. Earth was supposed to be moving with respect to the ether. So if we can see this effect that actually as Earth moves in the ether, we could observe that light travels at a bit different speed in the direction the Earth is moving with respect to the ether, or in the direction opposed to that, so in different directions, the velocity of light would be different. Are you with me? This is the same as in the past. Any questions so far? What's the definition of ether? The ether was this medium that does not exist. Who, who asked this question? Ether doesn't exist. It was invented until 1905 to explain the characteristics of light by making a story, right? The ether does not exist. <coughs> Yes, if ether would have existed and Maxwell's equation for a value only for an observer that is at rest with respect to uh, the ether, that means that in any other frame I can measure, <coughs> through measuring the velocity of light, uh, I can measure if I'm moving around with respect to the ether. And therefore there was a way of defining an absolute rest frame, which was this very important rest frame, which was the rest frame of the ether, singling out one reference frame. In, in, in reality, there is no way of saying that anything is at rest. Anything is at, is at rest with respect to an observer because the observer is moving with the object. But otherwise, <coughs> you cannot say, this is at rest. There is no way of singling out one particular reference frame or particular type of observer. All right, so we have to wait until uh, the end, practically, of um, the 1887, the end of the 18, uh, 19th century, uh, for Michelson and Morley to make probably the, to perform probably the most famous negative experiment. Uh, the good thing, the very important thing, is that they did not find what they set out to find, which was the relative velocity of Earth with respect to the ether. So they had, um, their experiment consisted in a race, okay, a race, uh, like a car race. In this case, it was a race between two rays of light. And they were trying to see if they could find um, the direction in which the Earth was moving with respect to the ether. Uh, if we were moving with respect to the ether, the velocity of light should be a bit smaller, the velocity of light should be a little larger. Right? It was a race between two rays of light and comparing <coughs> the speed of light in the two directions. They found no difference. No difference. And so what they found was they actually the velocity of light was the same, was exactly the same. Light was found to travel always at the same speed. 
So think for a moment, here I have my elaborate sediment. Okay. So assume I'm always throwing this ball with the same speed, okay? with respect to me. Now I'm running very fast and I throw the ball, same speed with respect to me. It will be faster with respect to you, right? <coughs> My speed will sum up to the speed with which I throw the ball, right? Are you with me or not? Yeah. Okay. Now I shine light. Okay? Light. Very bright light. Shine light. Okay? The light is moving with respect to me at the velocity of 300,000 uh, 300, kilometers per second. Assume that I would be moving very close, with a velocity very close to 300,000 kilometers per second. Right? I am not, but assume I could. <laughs> very fast. Right? So, the light is moving with C with respect to me. <coughs> And I am moving approximately with C with respect to you. <coughs> this light will still would be moving with respect to you with C, not with 2C. Right? It's very strange. Why? Okay. So the velocity of light is always C in vacuum, independently of the speed of the source or the speed of the observer. This is extremely anti-intuitive. Right? And it was then, as it is now, very unintuitive. I will mention this attracted, of course, the best minds of the time. One of the best minds of the time was Hendrik Lorentz, the most famous theoretical physicist. And he, he explained, um, he wrote all the equations to explain the results of the Michael's moral experiment. Why? Which way? But he had no idea of why. In fact, he came up with a very bogus idea. Uh, electrons, which form the outer layers of atoms from a kernel of electrons, had been discovered shortly before all this happened. And so he said, oh, maybe electrons have something to do with it. And it was. But still, he still believed in ether. But he uh, made all the math of this. So the math of relativity is not new. But you know, I made this long story, and where is Einstein? Now, Einstein was a nobody. He was, uh, he was a German, this is very young, 25, 26 years old. He was working in a patent office, this is about the least glamorous work that you can think of, patent office in Zurich. And um, one of the three absolutely seminal papers that he produced in one year, 1905, was this, the special theory of relativity. So he said, first of all, there are only two postulates. The first is, there's no absolute rest. Ether cannot exist. There is no way of measuring, doing any experiment with light or with anything else, that we are in a special reference frame. All observers, in all reference frames, moving at any speeds, would have the same results. So this was just a postulate of relativity, which, is called, which gives the name to the theory. The second, he said, I postulate. The speed of light is constant for all observers in vacuum, of course, because when the light uh, travels through a medium, it changes. In vacuum, it's always the velocity of light C, independently of the velocity of the source of the observer, as I just said. Of course, there are very important consequences of that. One of the consequences is people agree on the velocity of light. They don't agree on simultaneity. These are two pictures that come from the book that I think you used, Hewitt. So assume um, these two, this are two observers. One is inside a rocket, the other spaceship, and the other is outside it. 
both of them see light coming out a particular instant from a particular source, right? Now, this person who is at rest with the source sees the light reaching both ends of the uh, ship at the same time, right? Because he's equidistant. He's at the same distance, same speed. Are you with me? Oh, same time. Now, the same thing is observed from outside. But of course, for this observer, uh, this uh, ship is moving. The ship is moving. So, this end of the ship gets first to the light. And this one is coming apart. So, <coughs> she sees that light reaches first this point, and then after that point. Are you with me? That is strange. The two observers moving at different velocities do not agree on when two things happen at the same time or not, simultaneously. And this is very important. As, as Einstein said, all our measurement of time is based on simultaneity. He says, when we say uh, the train going to uh, whatever, uh, well, we, don't, we don't use trains. That's not but They use that. Train going to Santa Barbara leaves at 12 noon. What we mean is that when the train is leaving, okay, the clock will mark uh, 12 noon. This is the simultaneity between two things. So if we cannot agree on simultaneity, we cannot agree in our measurement of time. Time itself changes for different observers. And in fact, they are going to use a uh, light clock to see time dilation of moving clocks. So I will present this. We then are going to see a little bit of a movie in which there is a visualization, much better than the one I can say. And then we are going to derive um, mathematically by how much Time so assume that there is a light clock. This is a thought clock, right? This is an example that comes from mind. So uh, a ray of light is, uh, goes between two mirrors. Hmm? So when the ray of light hits the lower mi mirror, tick, when it goes up, tack, tick, tack, tick, tack, goes up and down, up and down, right? Now, from the observatory outside, this clock is now moving. So between the tick and the tack, the clock has moved from here to there. Tick, tack, tick. Are you with me? Yes? So now the distance between the tick and the tack is longer. But the speed of light is the same. So how much time elapses between the tick and the tack in this case than in this case? Is it longer or shorter? Longer. Longer distance, same speed. So here it will be tick, tack, tick, tack, here will be tick, tack, tick, tack. So the time of moving clocks for an observer, an observer who sees the clock passing by, hmm, sees it as marking the time uh, with the delay, the peak of the time. And, and this is time itself, it's not only this clock. Let us return to this in a moment. Consider normal. two observers in relative motion. In this case, Albert and Henry, just for the sake of argument. At the exact place and time they pass each other, they observe a flash of light. A sphere of light expands outward from that point. Since each measures the speed of light relative to himself, each believes correctly that he is always at the center of that expanding sphere. 
even though they themselves move farther and farther apart. How can two people in different places both be at the center of the same sphere? To confirm his perception, each sets up light detectors an equal distance apart. However, while Albert's detectors register the light arriving simultaneously, he believes the light strikes Henry's detectors at two different times. Meanwhile, Henry sees the same thing in reverse. They agree on the speed of light, but they disagree on whether events happen simultaneously or at different times. This is not semantics, nor a petty debate. It means that time, as well as distance, has to be affected by motion. It can be seen with the aid of the simplest possible clock. Two mirrors, a fixed distance apart. With a light beam bouncing back and forth between them. Each bounce of the beam is a tick or a tock of the timepiece. To Henry, his clock is stationary and altogether ordinary. But for Albert, that clock is moving. And between tick and tock, he sees the light beam trace a diagonal path, which means it's traveling a longer distance. But the speed of light is the same for all observers. So the light must take a longer time to travel the longer distance. Therefore, Albert believes the moving clock runs slow. But how slow? The relativity of time is derived from the right triangle formed by the distances traveled. The Pythagorean theorem shows that the path of the moving light is longer than the distance between mirrors. By the factor one over the square root of one minus b squared over c squared. This factor occurs so often in relativity that it is given its own symbol, the Greek letter gamma. So to an observer at rest, a moving light clock seems to be running too slowly by the factor gamma. A ruler, or anything else in motion, also seems contracted by that same factor. Sure. Okay, so here it is. So here we have, um, at rest, the clock at rest. So this is tic-tac, okay? Tic-tac. So obviously, this is C, the velocity of light, and the difference between the tick and the tack at rest, let me call it T0. This is at rest. Means that an observer that is moving with the clock, the clock is at rest with respect to the observer. Now assume that we see the same clock, but now it's moving. Now it's moving, so uh, the light leaves from here, but by the time it gets to the top, the clock has moved to here, right? And then subsequently, so this time, this distance, we 
will be, that the clock moves, will be V, T. V is the velocity now of the clock with respect to the observer. Are you with me? T. T. So this should be, actually, I don't know, right? This is the same distance. Now, tick was here, but tack is there. So, this length is CT. So here we have a rectangle triangle in which this is CT, this is VT, and this is C0. So you know the relation between the sides of a rectangle triangle, right? So what is the relation? The hypotenuse is square, the square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the square of the sides. That you know, right? So this is c squared <coughs> square is equal to b squared d squared plus c squared d zero squared. So far so good. So let me move <coughs> this to the other side. This is c squared minus b squared. C squared is equal to c squared is zero squared. Are you with me so far? Everybody? <laughs> Let me now divide by c squared both sides. So here I have one. C squared enters into the parenthesis. I have one, and then minus b squared over c squared. So here I have one minus b squared over c squared. <coughs> square is equal to d zero squared. So I would like t in terms of d zero, which is what I measure when the clock is at rest. Right. So now I pass this dividing is d zero squared over one minus d squared over d zero squared. Thank you. And now if I want t, I have to take the square root of both sides, right? So this is t, this is square root. And as I as it was said before, uh, this number, 1 over square root of 1, minus b squared over c squared is given the proper name called the gamma factor. This is the Greek letter gamma. So this is gamma d0, where this is for the time as measured um, when the clock is at rest, and this is moving. Moving with respect to the observer with a speed c b. This is then our result. Now this is almost well, when v is zero. How much is gamma? It's one, right? When v is zero, t is equal to t zero. And uh, actually, this is a function. Here you have a function plotted. The Lorentz gamma factor, as it is called, <laughs> is practically one for all velocities which are not very close to the velocity of light. So you have to go to three quarters the velocity of light before it actually departs from one significantly. Okay? So this is the equation we saw so far. So for example, if V is 85% of the velocity of light, gamma is 2. If V is 0.97%, 99.7%, 0.997, 
then gamma is 10. For the time being, let me talk about the time dilation. So assume um, gamma is 2. Now, this is time itself. It doesn't, you, uh, we developed, we found the gamma factor using this clock. But any other clock uh, would be the same. Because it's time itself. It's not a particular clock. <coughs> so for example, we have many gamma clocks. We read a certain rhythm. This could be the peak and the path. Our heart beats. Our cells divide with a particular period. We digest. Our, all our chemical processes happen at different times. Okay. So um, if a person on Earth sees a person traveling hmm, at, for example, a velocity V, this is one of the examples that I gave, um, 85% B is 0.85 of C. This person will see that the heart beat okay, takes double the time. All the molecular timings, particular time periods, characteristic time periods, uh, the division of cells, everything. Okay. happens uh, twice um, slower. Okay. The tick and the cat slow down. So um, the person actually becomes old <coughs> at a rate which is half as much. So for example, if a person travels, um, makes a trip of 10 years, goes someplace and comes back, okay? And T with respect to Earth is 10 years. That means that T0, the actual time that elapsed for the person who was all the time at rest with respect to himself, is only five years. So everybody on Earth would be 10 years older, 10 years had elapsed, but for the person who took the trip, only five years had elapsed. If the trip would have been <coughs> at 99.7% of the velocity of light, 10 years would have elapsed on Earth, but the person taking the trip would be how much older? One. Yes. Because gamma is 2, when V is 0.85C, this implies that gamma is 2. So as you see here, gamma is 2. So T0 is equal to T over 2 for a particular example. I'm using this equation. Okay. Uh, this is very strange. So it's assumed that um, the person took a certain distance. This distance measured from Earth is the distance L0. Now, this is a distance to a star, for example. It says, well, this person went to the star and came back. It took the person 10 years. Now the guy here says, come on, that's not true. I measure all the time my clock and only five years passed. Who is right? Both of them are. Both of them are. However, the guy went, guy or person, huh? she did go to the star and came back. So how come? certain distance, something has to give, right? So the guy says, the person in the uh, vessel says, no, 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 only half the time elapsed, but I went there and came. 
in fact, because the distance was half. So this is, imagine that this is a ruler. This is a ruler, L0, which is at rest with respect to the Earth. <laughs> when this vessel is moving, with respect to this spaceship, okay, this person, of course, is at rest with him or herself. However, this ruler, this distance between the star and the Earth is moving very fast. Right? So, moving rulers, moving distances are seen as shorter in the direction they are moving. So, for example, if I would be moving with respect to you, okay, in this direction, very fast, at 85% the velocity of light, I would say this, which is at rest with respect to me, to be one meter, as you are seeing it now. Okay? But you would see it contracted. You would see it as measuring half a meter. If I would be moving like this, this distance, would be still one meter for you. This distance in the direction of motion would be one half. If I will be moving at 99.7 C, okay, I will be moving in this direction very fast, 99.7 velocity of light, you would see this ruler how long? How long? 10 centimeters, exactly. So you see that you need both length contraction. This is called time dilation of moving clocks. Time dilation of moving clocks. <coughs> okay, by a factor gamma. And this is the distance, when this distance, okay, the ruler is L0 at rest, but it will be seen only as L. L is equal to L0 over gap. This is at rest, okay, and this is the moving. A ruler that is moving with velocity V in the direction in which it is move, moving would be seen as contracted. So let's claim contraction. <coughs> and both are necessary so that both observers agree. Okay? They have to agree because it has happened. The person was on Earth, went to the star and came back. Both agree. From Earth, they say, well, you went there, okay, because it took you 10 years. And the other person on the vessel says, no, okay, it took me only five years, but the distance was half. Okay? Time dilation and then contraction. <laughs> the example that we have just seen um, is called the twin paradox. Uh, the story goes that uh, there are two twins, and who therefore have the same age. One of them stays on Earth, and the other goes to a faraway um, star, uh, traveling at the velocity close to uh, the velocity of light, a fraction of the velocity of light, so that the, the effect is, is measurable. Um, and then comes back, and it is, uh, and this um, uh, brother who traveled um, is younger than the brother who stayed on Earth. Now, um, uh, why this is called a paradox? Well, a paradox is something that at first sight um, seems not to be true, but in reality, thinking of it again, it is true. So what is paradoxical about this? Well, um, one can think of the following. Motion is relative. 
So from the point of view of uh, the sibling who traveled in a spaceship, he was always at rest with respect to himself. But he saw Earth uh, moving uh, first away from him and then closer to him or her um, at a velocity which was a fraction of the velocity of light. Uh, so uh, from the point of view uh, of uh, an observer on Earth, uh, while the spaceship is traveling, um, the clocks in the spaceship are slowed down. But from the point of view of the spaceship, the same thing happens uh, while, the, uh, while the ship is moving at constant velocity. Um, the person is at rest with respect to himself on the ship, and uh, he or she sees the clocks on Earth moving um, slower than they should. Um, so at the end of the day, uh, which of the two brothers is younger? And the resolution of this uh, apparent paradox is that only one of them was accelerated. Um, accelerated observers are non-inertial observers. And um, an observer can distinguish if he or she is accelerated or not. So the person in the spaceship uh, can measure that it was him or her, the person traveling, that was initially accelerated to get to a velocity, a fraction of the velocity of light. Then when it got to the start, it had to be accelerated back again to return. Um, and then it had to be slowed down, another acceleration. So there are three periods of acceleration. And in these three periods of acceleration, um, the sibling uh, who is traveling has to change uh, from one um, inertial frame to another. And at that point, uh, it has to adjust its measurements of the clocks uh, of on Earth. So in reality, the younger brother is the one, the younger sibling is the one that traveled, that was accelerated. Now, if you were um, even more inquisitive, you could say, well, but you know, the brother that stayed on Earth um, was also, was traveling, was accelerated too, in this case by gravitational forces, because it's going around the sun together with the Earth, is a rotation, and therefore the velocity is not constant. Well, uh, in order to answer to this question, uh, one has to go to general relativity, which is a theory of gravity. Um, it is still correct that uh, uh, the um, uh, brother who stayed on Earth, who moved on what's called a geodesic, as we are going to explain in our class on general relativity, um, would be older than the brother uh, who did not stay in a, in, in a geodesic path, who was accelerated. So it's always the accelerated sibling who is younger. So we don't have these siblings, one of whom travels and so on. This is very unlikely to happen anytime soon. So uh, where are relativistic effects important uh, now, here and now? Uh, they're important 